Welcome back everyone. Hopefully we've shaken out the morning bugs. <laughs> so let's welcome Stefan Funke, uh, Head of Network Services at Anexia and PeeringDB Administrator. Uh, he's been in, in IT and networking for two decades now. And he's going to talk about one of those interdisciplinary things, which is super nice and super awesome, where um, like aviation has a ton of rules and ton of compliance and ton of checklists and ton of standard operating procedures and all those kind of things. And they tend to be part of why people don't die when flying um, and what we can learn from this in, in the networking or general IT space. Thank you. Over to you. So good morning, Dinak. Uh, I guess this is your non-technical talk for today. Uh, before someone asks, yes, I put a lot of effort uh, in drawing this picture and I will sell it later, of course. So my name is Stefan Funke, as, as already said, um, I'm with the next year's head of uh, network services. I'm the manager of multiple operation teams in networking sector. Uh, those teams run and manage worldwide operations, uh, networks, customers, and points of presences daily. Uh, besides my daily job, I'm also friends with people in the aviation area, or as they call themselves, uh, pilots. Uh, if you ever had the chance to sit next to a pilot in an airplane, you will have noticed that the whole process of flying an aircraft is precisely arranged. There are well-established standard operating procedures and guidelines in aviation that must be followed to safely operate an aircraft. Most standard operational procedures exist because things happened in the past, and yes, by things I mean accidents. In operations, however, the usual standard operational procedure is often freestyling. There's an incident or change, let's do it. You'll figure out as soon as we get there. Of course, there are global enterprises where everything is well prepared, well planned and automated, but in reality, in Joe Average's company, it's often not. As an engineer or manager, I took a look into the rules of the aviation world that we as a network operations people can copy to get our job done better. As a disclaimer, I'm not a pilot, but I know we do have pilots in the audience. Feel free to have discussions with them in the conference chat. At first, let's have a look uh, into something called alertment, uh, alertness assessment checklist. Before pilots and crew enter the aircraft, the whole flight is planned. And it usually starts with asking your team how they are doing. They ask questions like, how are you? How do you feel? Did you get enough sleep? Did you consume alcohol? Whenever my boss asked me how I was or how I felt when I was younger, I always thought, why do you care? It's money of a business. But think about it. Would you fly with an airplane if you would knew your pilot didn't sleep last night? Or worse, if your pilot was drunk? I thought so. And yes, the same applies to operation teams. Do you really want your coworker who didn't, lie, uh, who didn't sleep last night to make changes to the core network? Most likely uh, not. If your teammate asks you how you feel, it's not to fill time or have a shit chat. It's a safety check. Before carrying out changes, make sure your team is okay and alert. Second, the pre-flight inspection checklist. So think about pre-styling your network change. You log into your router, configure something. If you're good, you test it, and then you close the ticket, if you had any, and hope for the best. In aviation, however, there are checklists for everything, like are the flight controls free and correct? Does the landing gear control light show a valid value? Are the seat belts fastened? Are the brakes set? All those checklists follow a flow pattern from beginning to end. And checklist means you check it. You cross it 
off the list as checked. Follow those patterns and show you ensure that you do not forget anything. In your preparation during the flight, during the landing, and even after landing. Wouldn't it be nice to have the same for, the net, for, for a network change you have to carry out? At Anexia, for example, we started to create runbooks for changes. They follow a common pattern. So we have a pre-flight check. And in this pre-flight checks, there's things like send a notifier to the customer, send a notifier to the on-call teams, check the serial connectivity to the device you're trying to configure, and so on. You get what I'm trying to tell you. During the change phase, we have steps like pause the monitoring, send a maintenance reminder to the customers and to the on-call team, save the system status output to the ticket, and so on. Just make sure to follow your steps to not forget anything. And after the flight, and after flight check, so after the change, you do have usual steps like re-enable the monitoring, send end of maintenance notifier to the customer so that they know everything is done. During the change process, cross out completed tasks. You will have many standard changes that all follow the same pattern. Create runbooks for them. And once you have detailed runbooks for your routine changes, you might also automate them. But um, that's another topic for a different talk, I guess. A third topic, let's take a look into the sterile flight deck rule. In aviation, the sterile flight deck rule is a procedural requirement that during critical phases of flight, only activities required for the safe operation of the aircraft may be carried out by the flight crew and all non-essential activities in the cockpits are forbidden. Of course, there's a historical reason for that. In operations, we can and should copy that. The person who is debugging an outage or running a change should not answer customer calls simultaneously. Also, this person should not communicate detailed status reports at the same time. At the same time. Find someone to assist you during that phase. Keep it clean and focus on your work tasks. Next, I would like to talk about effective communication. There are also rules in aviation about communicating with your crew. It's all about clear communication. In operations, clear communication is also a must to ensure that your follow operators understand what you're trying to communicate. Follow simple rules. Ensure that the recipient of a message is ready and able to receive the information. Yes, you can talk to someone if the person on the phone or writing an email, uh, you can talk to someone if the person is on the phone or writing an email, but your input is most likely to get lost in that way. Select what, when, how, and with whom to communicate. We all had this situation. Someone in the room asked, to look into that one alert that just popped up. Who took the task? Right, usually no one, because there was not a specific person mentioned. So convey messages clearly, accurately, and concisely. Confirm that the recipient correctly understands essential information. Especially in emergency situations, ask if the person you're talking to has ultimately received that information. If you're the receiving partner, repeat the critical components of the information received for validation. Ask relevant and effective questions. Do not hesitate to ask questions. Just because someone else thinks you have the information and know how to handle, it doesn't mean you really do. When in doubt, ask questions. You might think that this is common sense, but in reality, Many people are afraid to ask. Number five, the two pilot rule. Did you ever notice that there are usually two or more pilots in the cockpit when you take a flight? 
The primary reason for having two pilots on every flight is safety. Usually, a flight crew consists of one pilot in command, the captain. The other pilot, the first officer, is the second in command. So obviously, if something happens to the captain, a plane must have another pilot to step in. Additionally, the first officer provides a second opinion on piloting decisions, keeping pilot error to a minimum, and so on. When the role of the pilot in command changes, there is clear communication repeating the information. The captain says, you have control. The first officer repeats, I have control. And then the captain repeats again, you have control, to acknowledge what the captain understood from the first officer. In operations, we can copy this procedure for extensive changes and day-to-day -day operations. Instead of having one person bring two operators, one operator is in control and follows the, run, uh, and follows the runbook. The other operator reads back the information and validates the results. This gives you the ability to double check every step with a second opinion and make better decisions in unexpected behaviors. After the change, clearly communicate your status. For example, say, I am off hands, to state that you are done and will not make any more changes to the system. Everyone understands that you locked up. At the sixth topic, I'd like to speak about constant feedback. A flight ends with a debrief meeting. In aviation, you will find something absent to a lot of operation teams, a learning culture and a no blame culture. A learning culture is a set of organizational values, conventions, processes, and practices that encourage individuals and organization as a whole to increase knowledge, competence, and performance. One of the, one of the procedures of a learning culture is to give constant feedback. I will feedback, I don't mean nitpicking or blaming your fellow operators. I mean it in a wholesome, bi-directional way. If you perform a task, ask for feedback. If you do a network change, make a debrief meeting with the other operators. Ask them what went well. What did not go well? What could you have done better? All those questions help you in your progress. As the reviewer, be honest and be wholesome. Provide appropriate feedback. This way you encourage reporting of mistakes and problems. So also many performance debriefings tell individuals what they are doing right and caring of them the opportunity should also tell them what they are doing wrong. Negative feedback must be offered constructively and diplomatically. When it comes to continuous learning, one of the best ways to trigger curiosity on a subject is to highlight a knowledge gap. In an year operations, we say it's okay to make a mistake, but it should be very hard to make that mistake again. So give your fellow operators that feedback. Next, there will, be, there will always be a better operator or pilot out there. One of the mistakes many humans make is to think they are perfect or the best in class. In reality, this is most likely not the case. Be honest, be humble. In aviation, most accidents are caused by human error. And by most, they mean something like 76% of all accidents are caused by humans. Very active pilot, every active pilot is always in constant training. They must have a certain amount of landings and flight hours to be able to fly an airplane. Their schedule is always practice, practice, practice. It is important to maintain practice constantly for perfection and safety. A pilot is trained to handle emergencies, to know the limits. A pilot is trained to practice failures again and again. 
Why do they do that? Because it is better to know what happens in case something goes wrong. You don't want to experience an engine fire when you have 300 people in the back of your aircraft for the first time. Things will go wrong. Pilots train to react to those failures. Well, let's have a look into operations again. When did you have your last simulation training of a failed backbone router? What do you do if your primary data center goes dark for a week? Oh, you have a plan, you say? Did you challenge your plan? Did you ever shut down your main data center for a training purpose? You most likely did not. And the changes are, uh, the chances are, uh, hi, that you will go into panic mode once shit hits the fan. Let's talk about redundancy. By the way, in aviation, everything is redundant. Do you remember the two pilots rule? Everything else is redundant too. And by everything, I mean everything. Everything in an aircraft is designed to fail. If something fails, redundancy kicks in and after landing, failed parts must be replaced. Never not skip that task. And there's no, oh, the other engine is still working. Uh, we continue operations until we have time to fix it. How do you run your IT operations? Do you have extra redundancy for everything? Did you try that? In my experience, in most companies, that is almost never the case. If you have a, have a chance to build something from scratch, build it with redundancies in mind or take the risk of failings. Let's have a look into, uh, let's have a look at two more topics. One is alarm fatigue. Did you ever hear about alarm fatigue? If you didn't, alarm fatigue is when you constantly get alarms from something and start to ignore it. Humans are so good at it, once you get used to it, you can live in a full room of alerts and you won't even notice. Have you ever been to a McDonald's restaurant before? Did you ever notice all the sound noises coming from the background and beeping and all those alerts? They beep forever. All those people in McDonald's, they never care. But you, as someone who's a guest to this restaurant, you really hear it and it is annoying. In aviation, the rule for that is simple. Only alert things that need your utterly urgent attention now. Make sure that the alert is unique. The critical engine field's notification sound should not be the same as the fasten your seatbelt signal. In operations though, real life samples from operation teams include things like the occasional, oh, only 30 days left until your SSL certificate expires, critical alarm. Or the urgent on-call SMS during the night telling you that the peering session with the small ISP just dropped. If you get bombarded with such information, you will start to ignore it. You will ignore it so long that you will not even notice when something really important breaks. Learn from aviation. Everything that is non-critical should never raise a critical alarm. It should never wake up the on-call team. If something is just informational, write it to a log file submit a ticket. The last topic for this, uh, the last topic for today is making decisions. Imagine the following situation. You're the pilot of a small airplane. You're up in a beautiful clear sky. In the far distance, you see another airplane coming directly into your direction. What do you do? There are many options in this, uh, in, this op in this situation. You can go left, you can go right. And since you're up in the sky, everything is three, three dimensional. You could simply just gain or lose more altitude to avoid crashing into that aircraft. Sounds, sounds simple, isn't it? Just make a decision. There is no time in overthinking about the situation. Lives are at risks. 
Pilots are trained to make decisions, or more precisely, to make consistent decisions. If you decide to go up, you better not overthink it and decide to go down again in a few seconds later. Outside of aviation, the general human tends to be really bad at making decisions. Do you remember the last time you asked your friend where to go for lunch? Such a simple question. But try to get an answer for that lunch question at 11.30 a.m., 30 minutes before lunchtime. But I guess that's at least one topic solved by Corona and staying at home, I guess. In operations, it's key to make decisions. If we, do, if we not do it quick, we tend to ignore making it at all. For example, there's one location where one of the upstream providers has some problems, but you have no clue what it is. Customers are complaining already. The typical network operator will start to analyze the problem of the other provider to prove that is not your problem at all. But does it fix anything? Make a decision. Drain the, that peering or upstream session and get your network back into a normal situation. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Ready for another example? Do you remember the nine tickets in your personal ticket queue? Of course you do. But you can't decide which ticket is the, last, the least fun and after a while, when some time passes, you forget about it. Try doing it the pilot's way. Take one ticket, get it done, and repeat. So there are many things that we can copy from aviation. They have standard operating procedures for nearly everything. And they have fine-tuned their standard operational procedures for about 70 years now. They built an environment where everything can fail, but they make sure to learn from it. They encourage safety and make sure everything follows a standard pattern. I believe IT and network operations can learn a lot uh, from pilots. So take a chance and have a chat with them in the, uh, in the conference chatting tool. And by that, that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are currently no questions in, in the question thing, but we have seven more minutes. So what would you say personally, how, what, what was the most challenging thing to to convince others to to try the same type of thing of course it tends to be not easy to change culture what what would you say were the hardest yep. things and also what how did you approach and solve this i guess in the, in the beginning the hardest thing was to to establish something like checklists so the usual culture is not to have checklists at all uh, some people prepare for, for changes of course so they think about the task that is in front of them, the, the, the things they need to change. But they just, they just think about it, they don't plan it. So uh, implementing those checklists and getting those checklists implemented is a bit challenging, especially for two teams that, that never did that before. Um, the other thing was getting implemented to getting those checklists checked by a second operator before you even start implementing something. So having this, 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 this usual work type where you plan a change from start to beginning, then you hand it over to someone else to read it uh, and, and make comments on it and, and give suggestions how you can do it better. It is challenging too. But this is just a, yeah, as you said, this is just something that operations has to learn, but it's well, well established in, under, uh, in other cultures. Mm -hmm. Did you find that you had to create most of the stuff yourself until until it started taking, or were you able to find initial um, allies? Um, well, I was very lucky because uh, we had a pilot in our team for a long time, and having this conversation with him, this conversations with him, really 
um, taught me a lot about those procedures and to understand that talking to each other and um, reviewing everything you do, for example, really helps you to grow and, and get a safer network, get a safer environment for everyone else. So I was lucky to have Theo in my team and Theo uh, as a pilot uh, had some good suggestions. So if you have the chance to, to, to talk to a pilot, um, go for a coffee or maybe lunch and start a conversation, uh, it really helps. Um, we have one question from the audience and we have a little bit more time. So if you have more questions, please ask them. Um, are you doing blameless postmortems? Yes, we do. Uh, we implemented blameless postmortems. And uh, one thing, one, one giveaway I can give you is um, uh, go to your favorite book dealer and um, order the, the Google SRE, SRE book. Um, most of the things you can copy from aviation are also outlined in that book. So we implemented uh, blameless postmortems. Uh, it's a well established process. Uh, we still need some improvement into keeping up with this uh, blameless postmortem. So after, after having one blameless postmortem, there are always a lot of tasks that must be done after all. Um, this is quite challenging to keep up with the pace of those uh, requirements, but yeah, we have it and it really helps understand what happened and to learn from your failures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one thing which I found helpful with blameless postmortems is to to basically, if I did something wrong, start with writing down what I did wrong uh, and, and be super explicit about it. Uh, so people see that you can talk about it and no one comes and yells at you or anything. Um, like having and establishing and encouraging a, a culture of where, where mistakes are okay and you don't get punished yeah. for them. That is very important. So showing that everyone makes failures and exposing them to everyone and make sure that they, they understand what you did wrong helps others to step forward and to, to accept that culture. So if you can establish this non-blaming culture in your company, it really helps you uh, growing and getting a stable network, getting operations better. So this is, this is the beginning. So um, start opening up uh, with your failures. Um, and I suggest include your management also. Um, include your management, pitch the idea of having blameless postmortems and having an open culture. You need their support. You need the support of everyone else in, in lower management to, to follow you. And if they don't want to follow you, um, try to at least establish it in your team or in your small group. Um, because when, what we learned in, uh, in the past is if a small team starts with it, uh, you, you gain, you, you gain so many, um, advantages from, from starting this process that people who talk with other, other teams or all other members of the company, this information spreads and you will see that the idea of having blameless postmortems is fastly adopted by other, uh, other departments. So uh, if you ever hesitated to start it, just just do it. You you, you can't lose anything, but you can just gain more. Thank you, thank you very much. We have two thank more questions. Better. For one, uh, I'll just paste okay. both of them into chat, uh, so we you can go through them uh, after. Um, and in thirty seconds, we are cutting over. Okay, thank you. I mean, See if you, you want time. to talk for twin, no, let's let's finish on time. <laughs> I paste them over. And I will read the comments. Yes. 